All right, guys, if you'll open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians. Uh, hopefully, again, that your Bible just kind of naturally falls open there. I, uh, this particular Bible I've had for a while, and it, it naturally falls over to, open to Ephesians, and Ephesians is out of my Bible, largely. Uh, interestingly enough, I, have an, I had another Bible that I was given. Elisa gave it to me uh, on our, uh, during the, uh, what, do we, what do you call it, the rehearsal dinner, there it is, the, the night before our wedding, and that Bible also, everything from Ephesians out just falls out every time I open it up. And so I hope that that means that uh, I'm increasingly learning those things that are, that are found there. And, it's, you know, these days we, we use all kinds of other things for our Bibles. We use phones and iPads and other things, but there is something about a Bible which is falling apart. Uh, and so I pray that even if you don't have a Bible that falls apart, maybe every time you t- hit the li- your little touch screen on your phone, it, it you know, just kind of automatically goes to one particular place. I don't know, but I, I pray that you are regularly immersing yourself in the Word of God. And I do pray that it, First Thessalonians has become, particularly for those who are memorizing it, just a, a precious uh, passage of Scripture for you. First Thessalonians chapter 1, I'm again going to read verses 1 through 10. We're going to finish up the chapter today, Lord willing, but it's kind of all one piece, so I just want to remind us of that, and uh, after we read it, then we'll, we'll dig into verses 8 through 10 to see the final thing that the Apostle Paul was, was thanking the Lord for in his prayer for the Thessalonians. So, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the presence of our God and Father, knowing, brethren, beloved by God, His choice of you. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. And then our verses for tonight, for the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith towards God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for a son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Now, it's interesting that one of the questions that was given to Rob tonight was, uh, use three words to describe our youth group. Well, I'd like to ask you to just think about, you don't have to give those words tonight, but you can think about them. If someone were to ask your closest friends, someone were to ask maybe your parents, maybe your siblings, and they were to say, what are three words that, you would, that they would use to describe you? What do you think they would be? Not so much what are three words you would use to describe yourself, but what are the three words that you, that you feel like that your friends would use or your parents or those closest to you would use to describe you? Think about that for a minute. And my prayer is that regardless of what else might come to mind, in the, in, that somewhere in those three words, that's, that somewhere in that description of you would be the name of Jesus, would be the name of the Lord. Because in verse 8, where we will start tonight, it says, for the word of the Lord is sounded forth from you. And that's what, that's what they were known for. They were known for, being, for having a faith in the Lord Jesus that was, that was strong, that was deep, that was vibrant, that was real, that was life-changing. They were, they were known for this, in fact, as, as, as far away as you know, some of the out- outreaches of, of, of Europe at that time, of, of Macedonia, of Greece, of those kinds of places, maybe even all the way to Rome, and maybe even they caught, certainly had caught the ears of the Apostle Paul where he was writing from in Corinth. He goes, how would people describe you? What would they say? What words would they use to describe your life? What we are in need of, it, it, more than anything else, is real conversion. And when someone is really converted, that is when they have a, have, their hearts have been changed. They have a true relationship with God because of the, the Word of God, the Spirit of God that has transformed them and come to live in, inside of them. They've repented and believed. Yes, when that happens, your lives are transformed. You, you don't need more religion. You don't need more Bible studies in one sense. You, you, you don't, certainly don't need more activities and more stuff. Above all things, you need a real conversion that always produces a powerful transformation. Your lives changed. And really, that's what we saw last week, isn't it? That the Apostle Paul, one of the things that he rejoiced, he rejoiced, he was always making mention of them in his prayers. He rejoiced in their 
work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope. And he rejoiced in the fact that they were chosen of God. And then he gave the reasons why he knew that they were chosen of God. And the first one was that they had had an effective proclamation of the gospel made to them. And, of course, the Apostle Paul knew that because he was the one that did it. And he said that effective proclamation came in word, it came in power, it came in the Holy Spirit, it came with full conviction. Those who were preaching it believed it fully, and it came with a godly example. And I hope that, that maybe in your small groups, and then maybe this last week, you considered the nature of your proclamation of the gospel. Do you actually proclaim the word in word? Do you tell people about it? Does it come in power? That is because you have properly understood and are proclaiming the truths of Scripture it comes with the Holy Spirit because he is the one who uses the truth of his word. And then does, did it, does it come for you with full conviction and does it come with a godly example? Well, if you were to proclaim the word to someone, would that be the most natural thing to them? You'd be like, wow, I mean, that just makes sense that you would know this holy God because your life really reflects that. Your life reflects his holiness. And then he says the other way that he knew that they were chosen of God was because of the effective transformation that was made with, within them and that they became right away Literally within, within days of their conversion, they became imitators of the apostles and of the Lord Jesus. They found those who, could, who would reflect for them the truth and character and nature of God, of Christ, and they began to follow them. And as they learned more about the Lord, and as they were introduced to his word, maybe in the Old Testament scriptures and then in the, in the, in the writings and teachings of the apostles, they started to imitate the Lord himself as they were told what he was like. Additionally, the word that they received, they, even though there was much tribulation, they had, they had perseverance in the midst of that, and then they became, because of that, an example to all the believers. Well, now let's talk about the third, uh, the third part of the, of the Thessalonians' life that the Apostle Paul was thankful for, and it really flows out of the fact that they were examples. How does he know? What kind of examples were they to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia? What did people have to say about them? So really, the, 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 the second thing he's thanking them for, or thanking the Lord for, that he knows that they are chosen of God, flows into the third one, that they are powerful witnesses and testimonies for God. And really, you guys, this is the fruit of God's choice. He has chosen you because he loves you. You are beloved of God. What a thought, what, what an idea that he would place his love on you. But his love always produces a transformation. The, the truth of the Spirit of God living inside of you, the truths and of the Word of God, all brought to you because of the great love of God to choose you even from before the beginning of time. It produces a transformation. And this is always true. Love changes us. That's what it does. And that's what the love of God does. It's powerful and effective. And so this first evidence, this first fruit of God's choice, really as, as a demonstration of the kind of example that the Thessalonians were setting, was a powerful proclamation of the gospel powerful proclamation of the gospel. And that's first on your outline. It says four, and the four just takes us back to what, what he said before. That is, you were examples, and the four tells us in the beginning of verse eight how they were examples. Here's how I know of this incredible example that you were to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia is that the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you. Now, this is really important. If, if, if you had to summarize the kinds of discussions that go on during your day, what would you say are the things that, that sound forth from you, that come forth either about your life or the things you talk about? Just give me some examples of the things you talk about, maybe the most throughout the day. Yeah, you can answer this, yes. Sure, school. I mean, school is always on your mind. We've got to do this, we've got to do that, we, we learn this, we learn that. What else? Sure, <laughs> school quickly moves aside when it's time to talk about what happens after school. Right? I get to do this or this, and you're pretty excited about that, yes. Okay, the plan. So she, so, so she knows this is coming, right? Okay, mom, what's the plan? And probably by now she's like, Brenna, I've told you the plan. Don't ask me the plan. But, but anyway, so, so okay, so you might, what's the plan? Some of you are kind of plan-oriented, so you want to talk about that, yes. Food. Of course, that's good to bring up. Uh, at, in the office, I'm, I'm well known for uh, about 10, well, I come in, usually eating something. About 10.30 in the morning, I go upstairs and come down with my mid-morning snack. Then I go out to lunch with someone. And then about 3.30, I go upstairs and come back down with my mid-afternoon snack. Then I have a snack before youth group, and then I have a snack. And food is much on my mind. Okay, so I'll talk about food. What else? What else do you talk about? What sounds forth from you? Yes, David. Women. women talking about, and that would, it, uh, probably both of you, <laughs> both men and women talk about women, but probably more men. All right, as in... You know, the relationships and other things that are on your mind. If David hadn't said that, you would have all been liars, men generally. Okay, what, what else is talked about? Are any of the ladies going to follow that up with? 
Men. <laughs> All right, anyway, so anything else that you guys think about? Yes. Okay, that's on your mind, and maybe you're talking about it. Anything else that you talk about a lot that sounds forth from you? Sure, talk about what you do with your friends. Guys, there are a lot of things we talk about, and all, most of those, nearly all of the things that you mentioned, especially food, are, are great things to talk about. But notice what sounds forth from the Thessalonians here. It's the word of the Lord. That is, it is the content of... Uh, uh, the, the truth of the gospel, or really the things about the, the truth about the person and work of Christ, his character and his nature. And these are the things that they were known for. In fact, it's really interesting, when it says the word of the Lord sounded forth from them, it's, again, ha most of you are doing grammar, and there's this idea of, in grammar of a passive verb. That is, it's a verb in which someone else is doing the action. And that's the idea here. It's almost as though, uh, certainly they were proclaiming the word of God, but almost even more so, the idea is that everyone looked at their passionate love of Jesus, and they were proclaiming the word of the Lord really for the Thessalonians. They saw their incredible faith, and they were telling everyone about the faith that the Thessalonians had. And that's an amazing thing, because, because maybe even you are active in proclaiming the word of the Lord. But imagine having the word of the Lord be, have molded you and shaped you so much that the only thing other people talk about about you is the word of the Lord. And, and the Lord carries with it some really important thoughts. The Lord is our master. The Lord then is our authority. The Lord is the one who has all power. The Lord is the one whom we worship. The Lord is the one whom we, we love to obey. This is not the word of Chris or the word of Gavin or the word of anyone else in here or, or, or you know, some authoritative figure, the word of Obama. This, this is the word of the Lord, and it's worth listening to. And so I would encourage you, as you consider the nature of your own life and the messages that come forth from your lips, not that you would stop talking about those things. Generally, those are things we need to talk about most of the time. That you would eliminate things that shouldn't be talked about, but that constantly coming forth from you and about you would be the word of the Lord, the content, the truths of Scripture, the, the principles of God's word that are true. Because His is the only word that is always true. He's, you're, in all of, your, all of your classes, you know, Josiah's got an assignment right now. He's been, he's been quoting things to me. He's got all these quotes he's supposed to do and then write, write little whole um, paragraphs or, or pages about these particular quotes and how they changed his life. I guess the bottom line is the word of men, as powerful as it may be, it fades, it fails, it's, it's temporal, it isn't always even true. But the word of the Lord is always true. The word of the Lord never fades. The word of the Lord says the scriptures lasts forever. So it's worthwhile to be talking about. And this is what they were proclaiming. It says, the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you. So it was being proclaimed boldly. The idea of sounded forth is the idea of a trumpet blaring. Right? Maybe the, you know, the, the, the call to arms or whatever it might be. It's the, or perhaps even the roll of thunder. When you hear that, you, you, you stand up straight. When you hear that, you, you know, it's like, oh, there, there's a trumpet sounding. Or there's there's a, a massive thunderclap. It's, it instantly captures your attention. Well, this word was proclaimed by them and about them in a manner that is bold. There was no mistaking its sound. There's no hiding its source. Perhaps we could say the gospel boomed forth from the Thessalonians. It couldn't be hidden. And again, I, I occasionally have had opportunity to speak with you guys about people that you know or friendships that you have. And, uh, you know, we had biblical manhood and womanhood not too long ago, and you're trying to decide who to have a relationship with. And you know, sometimes I'll, I'll ask, you know, is that person you want to have a relationship with, are they a Christian? And sometimes the answer that I get is, well, I'm not sure, I don't know, or I think so. Well, that doesn't sound like the word of the Lord booming forth. But if the word of the Lord is just, it's just exploding forth from you and about you, then people ought to know. And that was true about the Thessalonians. Everybody knew it. They weren't afraid of it. They reveled in it. They rejoiced in it. Yes, the word of the Lord, that is the, 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 the words about and from the Lord of the universe who died for you, who rose from the dead, who lives forever, that's nothing to be ashamed of. It's nothing to hide. It's nothing to hold back. It certainly isn't the last thing that you would enter into a friendship or, or you know, you'd say in your friendship, you know, people say that, friendship evangelism. So we'll start off by just talking about all the things that are normal and natural to you and then eventually we'll work it around to Jesus. Really? I mean, if the Lord Jesus is the most important thing to you, then that's probably the thing you would lead with. I'm a lover of Christ. He's, he's changed my life. Yeah, I mean, I like other things. They're great, but it would, certainly wouldn't be the last thing. 
Imagine having a friendship with someone for, you know, a couple of months, and all of a sudden, you know, at the end of those two months, they're like, oh, by the way, you might not have known this, but I, I love Jesus. I'm a Christian. Like, well, when were you going to get around to telling me that? If that's the most important thing in the world to you guys, it's the thing that comes out. They proclaimed it boldly. You can't hide thunder. People go, what was that? And so it is that the word of the Lord should be proclaimed forth boldly from you and about you. And really, that's more probably the idea. People say, that's a person that loves Jesus. That's a person that has faith in Jesus. The other idea of this word or the way this word is, is written uh, in the original language is that it was proclaimed continually. It wasn't just one time. This was going forth and forth and forth, and it was spreading further and further. So it wasn't like, yeah, it's kind of a passing fad for these Thessalonians. Yeah, it kind of it flared up a little bit. They loved the Lord, and now it's going, and, and, and the proclamation about them is starting to fade. No, the proclamation is continuing to spread. And it's really interesting. It doesn't, again, the idea doesn't seem like there was some kind of evangelism campaign that the Thessalonians went on. Well, now that we're saved, we'll put together our evangelism implosion, and every day and every week we'll be out uh, in this official manner proclaiming the gospel. It was like this was just naturally pouring forth from them. So let me tell you something. A church, a youth group, individuals give evidence of, of the powerful work of God in them and their growth when the word of the Lord just starts to pour forth continually. It's fine to have programs. It's fine to have things that get us together. This summer, by the way, a little plug ahead of time, we're, we'll, we'll do again our in-town missions where we spend a week here at the church and then we go out and we, we go door-to-door -door witnessing and we have other avenues for evangelism and those things. We're going to do that again. The word of the Lord is going to sound forth from us. But guys, if, if we have to program it into a week in the summer, and by the way, I don't think we do. I, I, I hear you guys. I, I know it comes forth out of you. But guys, when it just starts to naturally come out, and when people can't help but talk about how the Lord has changed you, then there's a powerful work of God going on. And that's what I long for for our church. It's what I long for for you. That you don't have to manufacture it. You don't have to, you know, it's great to have those opportunities, but it's, just, it's what you want to do, and it's what happens almost spontaneously. Again, there's nothing wrong with, you know, developing ministries and programs that, that put us in positions to do it, but that doesn't seem to be what was going on here. They were constantly proclaiming the word. And Romans 10, 14 speaks of why this is so necessary. It says, how then will they call on him whom they have not believed? Because Romans 10, 13 was all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's a wonderful, fantastic promise that everyone who truly believes, who repents and believes that they will be saved. And yet the next question is, but how can they call on someone they haven't believed in. And, and then it goes on to say, how will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they're sent? Just as, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. They have beautiful feet. Those who, who carry a good message is the idea, not that their feet are so pretty. Right? The idea is that, that it's, it, they're beautiful or the feet are beautiful because they are carrying this incredible message. Is that you? Is the gospel proclaimed from you boldly? Is it pro proclaimed continually? And then in our context here, it was proclaimed widely. If you look back again at verse 8, for the word of the Lord has sounded, boomed forth, trumpeted, thundered forth from you. And the, in this continual fashion, in an ongoing way, constantly is just pouring forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, that's the, the regions right where they were, right around Thessalonica, but also in every place your faith towards God has gone forth. Everywhere, it's going all over the place. And certainly it wasn't every place in the known world at that time. But it was every place where, where, where people had any exposure to the Thessalonians and anyone who knew them was going forth and talking about these things that had happened. And remember, again, this wasn't just the Thessalonians themselves. This was people who had been through Thessalonica and said, there's this amazing thing going on. There was these people who, who, who were, were pagans or they were, they were Jews and the, all of a sudden they heard this message and they responded, and, and their lives are totally changed. They're completely transformed. And they're being persecuted all over the place. They're being harmed for their faith, and yet they're continuing to serve this God that they say is so great that they say they believed in. This is amazing. You've got to hear about this. So the trades people coming through, it's going out on the ships, it's going out on the, on the chariots as people go by, it's going out in the caravans. Wow, there's an amazing thing happening in Thessalonica. Would that not be amazing? If Grace Community Church, if, if again, this particular youth group, wouldn't it be incredible if that, if that began to and, and, and maybe just increased in being the case? 
Have you, have you heard about that group? They love the Lord. They proclaim the Lord. Even when things are difficult, they love him. It says, in every place your faith towards God has gone forth. And this is interesting because oftentimes, the Apostle Paul uses the word faith in a more objective sense. That is your, the, 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 the content of the faith. But that doesn't seem to be the indication here. And, and the reason I think it is is because largely this testimony is being made by other people. They're talking about how great the faith of the Thessalonians is. That is, how great is their trust in this God that they have believed in. And, and the reason they know that the trust is so great is because in the midst of persecution, they've continued to hold fast to the truths about God. Right, so the idea of the faith here doesn't, isn't devoid of or doesn't set aside the content of the faith, what they believed in and the person they believed in. But the emphasis here seems to be on the strength of their belief because they didn't give it up when things got hard and because it just continues to pour forth in the midst of difficulty. They received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. In 2 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul says, your faith is greatly enlarged. The love of each one of you towards one another grows ever greater. He says, and we give thanks to the churches of God because of your perseverance and faith in the midst of the persecutions and sufferings which you have endured. Their faith was strong. Now I ask you, well, you you're, we are, you are, not suffering that kind of persecution, none of us. Some of you suffer more than others. You have opportunities for people to make fun of you and other things. But yes, how, strong are, how strongly are you clinging to Christ? How, how strong is your faith? And again, the issue is not so much your, your conjuring up that faith, how strongly you believe, but how convinced are you of the reality of the God that you serve? That's part of, remember, the nature of the gospel and how it's proclaimed is there's this firm conviction. And what shakes your faith? What causes you to, to relinquish or, or to, to let go of this, this trust that you have? Is it difficulty? Is it the pleasures of the world? Is it the call of a relationship, some relationship or other, that your trust in the Lord, as it were, begins to wane because you want to pursue this other thing? Or does your faith, your trust in the Lord remain strong because you remain convinced of the truth of the Lord Jesus, the truth of what he has said and done, and nothing can get in the way of that. You're absolutely convinced. And you're only going to be and remain absolutely convinced as you are pouring yourself into the word, as you are understanding what, what, what Jesus has done and who God is, that's why we do this over and over on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings. It's why we urge you to be in the word. It's why we urge you to memorize the word because everything else starts to get in the way if you aren't clinging tightly to the truths about Jesus and aren't constantly immersed in them and reminded of them. You guys know that that is true. When you begin to set aside your time in the word daily, when you begin to kind of just treat, either treat it as kind of a rote thing that you do or you let go of it all together or you're not really taking the time to understand what you're reading, what you find is that you start questioning the things about Scripture. Well, you might not question whether or not you know, God actually exists or whether Jesus did what he said he did, but you start to question, well, how important is it really to obey my parents? How important is it really to obey the commands of God? How important is it really to, to be honest in everything? You start to question those things. You need a reality check every day. You need to be diving into the Word to remember. And I'll tell you, that's what, that's what the Word of, of God does for me. I don't just read it in the morning because I have to do it. I'm reminded as I dive into the Word and, and, and just as I spend time personally reading that, oh, this is the real world. This is how things really work. This is, this is the God who drives all of history and drives all of the world and is, and is behind everything. Oh, yeah, I forgot that being immersed in the world. You guys, you'll forget it too. This is reality. And, and the Thessalonians were immersed in this reality and it was, it was flowing forth from them, proclaimed widely everywhere that people went, this trust that they had in Christ on the basis of his person and his work that they believed in, that he had died for them, that he'd risen from the grave, that he had paid for their sins, that he had satisfied the wrath of God, that he had given them his righteousness, that he was returning again as we will see to save them. So your faith towards God has gone forth. It's been traveling. Paul says a similar thing in Romans 1.8 about the Romans. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. And wouldn't that be exciting if our faith were being proclaimed throughout the whole world? Now, 
it, the thing that just sprung to mind as I thought about the idea of someone, you know, a group of people believing in the Lord and this witness going out, flowing out from them, I couldn't help but think of where? Ketutan, right? Where you had a one, one village that's impacted by the word of God, some 300 people, uh, uh, seems like almost all of them or many of them come to know Christ, and now that is spread from village to village to village. The truth of the scriptures, the reality of the gospel, but also the nature of the faith of those first believers in Ittutong that are carrying, that are propelling that message all throughout that region and now into other tribal groups and other places. It's just exploding all throughout the region. Their faith towards God has gone forth, not only in Ittutong, but also in Bogan, also in Tangwa, if you are familiar with, if you've been reading any of the stuff that's going on. That's what an amazing thought. There's much work for us to do when it comes to the word of God being proclaimed widely, not only by us, but about us, and the fact that our faith, our trust in the Lord is the thing that characterizes us. I mean, what do you trust in? Trust in your abilities, trust in your family, trust in your intelligence, trust in your security and comfort. What do you trust in? Are you known as one whose trust is in the Lord? At the end of the day, regardless of anything else, if that's what was asked, what does that person trust in? Who or what is Amethyst trusting in? Who or what is Kenley trusting in? Because if someone were to ask, what would people say? Would they even know? Like, what kind of question is that? That's a weird question. Not a weird question. And people ought to know because they need something to trust in, don't they? Are we going to trust in our government? Scary. Are you going to trust in your friends? Scarier still. I mean, they, they can't provide for you what you need. You've got to trust in Jesus? Well, that's the word of the Lord. It's worth trusting. So, and also, interestingly enough, um, this is one of my favorites, it was proclaimed preemptively. You can just write that, however you want to spell that word, preemptively. But I love this part of it. This is great. For the word of the Lord is sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith towards God has gone forth. So in every place your faith towards God is going forth, every place someone goes with, with, you know, with an understanding of you, they talk about faith. But then it says so that we have no need to say anything. And it's, it's, it's almost like the Apostle Paul, it's not really frustrated here, but it's, just, it's a fascinating way to say that. Every time, let's, you know, let's say somebody comes to him or he's walking or he's in Corinth or whatever, he's talking to people, and he, he says, you know, let me tell you about, there's this, this is an amazing group of people. I, I had the chance of, of taking the gospel there. I want to tell you about the, th and, and right as he's about to say that, like, well, wait, before you tell me about that, I want to tell you about this amazing group of people called the Thessalonians. And Paul's like, that's what I was going to tell you about. I was going to, no, and then they say, oh man, their faith, they, as we'll see, they turn to God from idols, they, they had a tremendous response, they're obeying the Lord, their faith is strong, they're being persecuted and they're loving the Lord. He couldn't even get the words out. Every time he tried to talk about the Thessalonians, someone else was saying, have you heard about the Thessalonians? And that's a really cool thing when you think about it. Their faith was so great that, that Paul said, we don't even need, we can't, we can't even tell anybody about it because they keep telling us. Every time he's about to revel others with a story about the Thessalonians, they beat him to the punch with a story of their own. Now, you guys know how this goes, and, and I, I think you've been there, where you're, you're just kind of standing around in a circle, you're hanging out after youth group, or maybe you're at camp, and all of a sudden you start telling stories, you know, and, and the story about what you did, and then someone jumps in with a story about what they did, and the next person jumps in with a story about what they did. Right? That, I mean, that happens. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be exciting? If every time you started to tell a story, do those things, and all of a sudden the stories were about how the faith in how faith in the Lord, how the truth of the Word of God was transforming someone else in the youth group. And, oh yeah, but wait, but wait do, you, do, you have, do you remember how so-and-so is doing this? Do you remember what they did? Yeah. Have you been seeing how the Lord is changing so-and-so? And, and the stories just kept going, but all about how the Lord was changing people's lives. Now again, I think you guys talk about that stuff. I've heard you talk about it, and that's exciting. But it, it's ever increasingly exciting and it would be, if every time you went to try to talk to someone about whatever, instantly they were jumping in about how the Lord was changing the people around you, the people that knew Christ. You guys, we, we would know, we know when that begins to happen, that vibrancy, that a, a love for Christ is beginning to catch hold and, and, and take root in our hearts. Would that our joyful faith, obedience, and service would be well known in our own group, throughout the church, throughout the city and think about it this way. I mean, you guys have friends and relatives, and you have all these Facebook people that are like probably all over the world. For some of you, if you went to Argentina, you've got 800 friends from Argentina that you don't even, can't even pronounce their names. Every day I get another person that wants to be my friend in Argentina. 
And I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know, I can hit the translate and find out kind of what they're saying, but I figured they must have known me from somewhere. Because think about how that can begin to spread, even in a world like this. And what's being, what's being spread about you? Well, let me use Facebook for a minute. How many of you have a Facebook page, just out of curiosity? Yeah, yeah quite some are, I'm ashamed. Uh, or if you don't have Facebook, it's Google+, Plus, or as I said, it always, it's, there's increasing layers of, of things that you can have, and words that I don't even know. Well, yeah, you're, not, you're not hip, you don't even know the cool, you know, Facebook I know is no longer cool, I get that. But uh, first time, it still is. You don't know better than it's not cool anymore. Now, regardless of making the judgment about your Facebook page, wouldn't it be an amazing thing if everybody that could have a chance to, you know, every friend that makes a comment about you and, and then the, the, the things that they can see, your comments, that that just starts to spread and that what spreads is how much you love the Lord. And they, they hit your Facebook page from wherever, from a comment or, you know, you all go check your notifications, right? How many notifications do I have? And then you go to the likes to see who actually liked what I said and, and you do all that stuff. And amazing, if, it wouldn't it be amazing if every time you did that, the thing that was being noticed, the thing that was being proclaimed was your faith towards God, your, your love for the word of God. And just went out from there. Instead of your foolish views about whatever. Uh, you know, and, and, and you're going to comment on this thing and that thing. Guess, again, some of that's fine. Not all of it, some of it. But wouldn't it be amazing if, if, if the thing that just washed over your, you know, your Facebook influence was that this young person, this young woman, this young man loves Jesus. And everything about your Facebook page. They just rifle through it going, wow, that, that talks about Jesus and that talks about Jesus. Now guys, you could put a fake... Facebook page that does that. This is my Love Jesus page, and then I go to Google Plus for my, you know, me page. Blah. I mean, come on, you would accomplish nothing. But, w but what if that Facebook page that talks about the things of Jesus in every place actually reflected your, your very core nature? Not that you couldn't talk about, I love, you know, I love sports, or I love other things. That, that could be on there. But that all of that was grounded and, and bounded by your love for Jesus. You ought to think about that. I don't do a lot of surfing of Facebook pages. That can, that can be kind of dangerous. Uh, I, I don't do that. But, but I do watch your comments. And, if, and that's why nobody friends me anymore from the, from the church or the youth group. They're like, he's watching. I am. I'm listening. And, but I guess it becomes pretty obvious what's most on your mind when that happens. And for many of you, that's a joy to, for me to watch you do those things. Because wouldn't it be amazing if everywhere, ever increasingly, and in fact, even on Facebook, as, as people, you know, I've got this friend and, Man, they love Jesus. And you, you guys, your influence could spread to Argentina. In fact, it could spread in our day and age. Just you, just little teeny you and me. Do you realize your influence actually could spread all the way around the world through the connections of friends that happen and this person lo loves Jesus and that went forth? It could happen. Now, to me, that's the exciting thing about some of, some of the ways this social stuff works if it's used for Jesus. Well, the Thessalonians didn't need Facebook. Right. They had chariot book or whatever it was. Just, people were taking it out and proclaiming everywhere their love for, for Jesus. It was so great, in fact, that when anyone tried to talk, you know, when Paul tried to talk about them, someone else told him what they were already doing. Right, so that was, that was the first thing that he praises the Lord for, that the, their powerful proclamation of the gospel. Well, there's, an, there's another thing, and this is their radical rejection of idolatry. And by the way, these two have to go together. You can't powerfully proclaim the gospel if you don't radically reject the idols of the world because that's the gospel, that you don't serve or worship idols. You don't serve or worship sinful things. You're lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes and boastful pride of life. Instead, you are serving and worshiping and honoring the King of kings and Lord of lords. That's salvation. That's really the message that was going forth because here's what was being said about them. Here's, here, here's why we know that the nature of their life-changing faith was what was being proclaimed, because he said, this is what we hear. He says, they themselves, that is all these other people who are talking about you, Thessalonians, they themselves, the ones who keep interrupting us about how, you know, how great you are, what your faith is like. This is what they say. This is the content of the report. And, and again, I'd love for this to be all of your, you know, your Facebook quote profile whatever you call them, statuses. That, that is, that this is, you know, all about, you know, I would hope that it would be all about Chris Reiser, that he has turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. But that's what people would know about me. That's what people would know about you. That Michael and Maya and Lauren and 
and Emily, that, that, that's what they would know, that, that, that they've turned to God from idols. They, they, they don't worship the foolish, vain things of the world. Instead, they worship the living and true God. It's the one thing that truly matters to them. They report us what kind of a reception we had with you, that you rejected, number one, slavery to dead, false idols. Dead, false gods, you could put there. They turn to God from idols. Guys, what's an idol? An idol is anything that you will worship, essentially. That's not the true God. To make it a little more specific, an idol is anything you'll sin to get, sin to keep, or sin because you don't have. If any of these is the case, the object or desire has become more important than God himself, and thus is being worshipped above him. That's an idol. Anything you'll sin to get, sin to keep, sin because you don't have, it means your desire for it is greater than your desire for God. What is that for you? What will you sin to get? I don't have that, and my pleasure is bound up in getting it, so I'll sin to obtain it. Maybe for you, it's popularity. And I'm not very popular. I don't have a group, and, and so I'll, I'll sin to get that group. I'll, I'll give in in, in my, my... I'll compromise the things of the Lord in order to get that. Or I'll appear to be someone that I'm not. I'll, I'll, I'll be a hypocrite to get that. For some of you, maybe it's, it's success in school, and so you'll cheat or you'll, you'll, you do other ways to get ahead. For some of you, it's success in sports, and so you, you, you will compromise your witness, and maybe you'll compromise your time in the Word or, or time with the body of Christ because you so desperately desire that thing, whatever it might be. Because what's your idol? Unbelievers are driven only by idols. That is, they don't serve or love the living and true God, and everything for them becomes, everything else becomes an object of worship. Ultimately, it's, it's founded in themselves. They worship themselves. Their own pleasure is the primary idol. But all of our hearts, you guys, are, are idol-making factories. We, just, we invent this idol or that idol. Anything can become an idol. Your entertainment. For some of you, music is a strong idol for you. And you hold on to that. I, I, won't, I won't allow my thinking and, and, and my love for Jesus to transform everything I listen to because I'm holding on to that one. Why? What is so important about it? What is the pleasure that's driving you? Is it greater than the pleasure of serving and loving and being loved by the God of the universe? Is it greater? See, that's the problem with idols. They can't actually provide you anything worthwhile because they're dead. They don't exist. And the only real things behind idols are demons. We studied that in 1 Corinthians, right? And the goal of the demons and the goal of Satan who runs the demons is what? To kill you, destroy you, and take you to hell. That's not a real great object of worship. You know, yeah, you know, the thing that I really am investing my time in ultimately is run by and is, is developed by the one who wants to destroy my soul. But it sure feels good right now. And it does. Let's say idols feel, they appear. The reason they're idols is because, again, they're driven by our pleasures. There's the thing, they, they are the things you want. And they come in the form of, you know, either external things or internal desires, wrestles. But you guys, the Thessalonians had turned from those idols. They turned away and said, we're not going to serve and worship our own desires. We're not going to worship our lustfulness and our desire for sexual pleasure. We're not going to worship any longer our desire for financial pleasure, our, our desire for success and for acclaim, for fame, for status. We're not going to worship that anymore. We're not going to worship ourselves. We're going to worship the living and true God. They turned. The idea is a total 180 from serving the idols, these, these dead gods, to turning around completely to serving the Lord Jesus to serving God, the living and true God. And guys, what, what, what have I just described? It's called repentance. Because to serve and worship anything other than the Lord Jesus is what? That's the ultimate sin. It is falling short of his glory. Any idol, it doesn't matter what it is, is less than the glory of God because he's not receiving the honor he deserves and condemns us to eternal hell. Any idol, anything, that's not him. You have to worship him. And so they had repented. They had turned. And this is the essential step in every conversion where we recognize the greatness of God. We recognize our own sinful attempts to either escape him or rebel against him or to replace him with our own righteousness or anything else that it might be. We turn from that and say, I'm wrong. That's sin. I deserve eternal hell. I'm going to cling instead to the work and person of Christ. Want to play a little American Idol with me? Like, whoa, he's going to like bust out in song or something? No. 
I'm going to bust out with some idols. Pleasure, success, popularity, lust, independence, internet, self-righteous piety, false humility, ungodly liberty, rebellion against authority, parental approval, peer acceptance, personal satisfaction, hardened bitterness, stifling, ungratefulness, smoldering anger. I could go on. Those are the American idols. It's probably the idols for most anyone. Are you, are you run by them? Is your life determined by your idols? Then you're not a believer. If you've turned to God from idols, and yet that you wrestle with idolatry in your life, then you're a believer who needs to grow in maturity, which is what we all need to do. But the Thessalonians were characterized by the fact that they were not dominated by their idols. They had turned. And, and every unbeliever, you guys, you may not think this is true, but every unbeliever is an absolute slave to those idols. They think they're free. No, I'm free to choose. Yeah, you're free to choose your dead idol. Fly at it. Pick the one you want. They're all the same. They'll all lead you to eternal hell, and they're all only a reflection of your own sinful desires. That's all they are. So, so go ahead and pick it. You're run by them. The world is not free. Don't believe that lie. They tell you you're a slave. Well, you are in a sense, but you are a slave as we will see, to the one who is living and active and loves you and, and grants you eternal life. You are not a slave to the one who is seeking to kill you and would, if he could, drag you to eternal punishment. It's a pretty big difference between the kinds of slavery. And in fact, your slavery to God is actually freedom to do everything that is good and right and joyful and satisfying. So to turn to God from idols is the step that every person must make in order to become a believer, and this is what had happened. They embraced, then, number two, slavery to the living and true God, to serve. They turned to God from idols to serve. You don't turn to God from idols to do what you want, except, and as, that what you want is what God wants. So don't say, I'm going to come to Christ, and that's wonderful that he saved me, and I'm going to do my own thing. I'm my own Lord and Master, and so, you know, I don't want to be ruled by idols. I want to be ruled by me. Well, you're still ruled by idols, then. There's only one person to be ruled by, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ to serve this living and true God who sent his Son to be your Savior and your Lord and your Master. Is do you understand that? That you were saved, that you turned from the idols, the dead idols you served, without any choice. By the Lord's grace, he broke into your heart so that you could choose him, and now you have the precious privilege of, of choosing to serve him each and every day. What a blessing. This God is the exact opposite of the idols that are dead and false. He is living and true. If you want to get a, a mind picture around it, what unbelievers do is they spend all of their lives, and most of you are familiar with Scripture in the Old Testament, they spend all of their lives dancing around the idol of Baal, asking for it to bring down fire. You know the story, right? Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And they dance around the idol and dance around the idol and cut themselves and scream and yell. I mean, think about the frenzy that your friends are in to get their entertainment, to get their fun, to get their things. I mean, they will, they will give lots of things. And, and people spend their whole lives in this frenzy, dancing around the idol of Baal, as it were. And what did Elijah say to them? Well, maybe God is gone. Actually, he said, maybe he's in the restroom. <laughs> he, he can't hear you. What's the matter? And that's, that, guys, that's true. The world dances around a bunch of idols that can't even hear them. Elijah, however, what? He served the living and true God. He, doesn't dan he didn't dance around or jump up and down or any of those things. He, he walked out in front of the people and he said, God, I know you hear me. And I ask you to show yourself to be the living and true God and set this on fire. And fire fell because he's the living and true God. That's the God you serve. He's real. And he's powerful. And he's not a dead idol. Why well, give your life serving the dead idols? The Thessalonians said, we're not doing it. By the Lord's grace, because of God's gracious choice of them, they turned to this living God, and they turned because they had been presented with a reality of his salvation, of the beauty of his character. I love the poem. I, I think my, my favorite commentator on this book, Hebert, wrote it. I, I don't remember that there was another. He might have given credit to someone else. Because he says, the reason that we turn to God from idols is because by his grace, he enables us to recognize his beauty and his power in his glory. And here's the little poem. It says, What has stripped the seeming beauty from the idols of the earth? Not the sense of right or duty, but the sight of peerless worth. Not the crushing of the idols with its bitter void and smart, but the beaming of his beauty and the unveiling of his heart. That's, that's, what, that's what changes us. When we see the greatness of God. Have you seen it? Some of you haven't. 
you're sitting here tonight because your parents are a part of this church and you like the, you know, you enjoy the youth group and probably enjoy, you know, from time to time the teaching, but you haven't seen the beauty of Jesus yet. The greatness, the power of Jesus. You haven't seen it. And I pray that you will. Because otherwise you will remain captured by your idols. And you will not turn. But some of you have. And your lives are different. You are different. You are changed. I can see it. And the other people around you, they can see it. When you're really captivated by the person of Christ, when you've turned to the living and true God, people know. And, and they will proclaim that about you. And you will know. You will know when you have been captivated by the greatness of your God. Let's play, let's play then. We played a little American Idol. How about we play a little Godly Slavery? Want to play that? Because really, you, you turn from, from idols to serve a living and true God. Godly slavery means this. Delighted, delightful time in the word. Joyful time in prayer. Fellowship with believers, obedience to parents, excellent, diligent work, active love for others. Consideration of others is more important than yourself. Delight in compassion and mercy. Reveling in gracious forgiveness. It's a lot better than the list I read you before, isn't it? That's what you get when you're a slave to the living and true God. Everything else that people tell you to believe in is a lie and it's dead. Whether it's intellectualism, hedonism, you're pursuing your... Guys, those idols are all dead and they're all lies. Your God is alive and he is true. Why not serve him? Why not trust him? Well, there's a last thing that they were doing. They had a patient, hopeful expectation of rescue. I think yours just says hopeful expectation of rescue. Add patient. Patient, hopeful expectation of rescue. So they turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for a son from heaven whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Yes, the reason that you are so excited about your Christian life is because of the greatness of your Savior, the freedom that he's given you to serve him, and the fact that he's coming back to get you. This isn't all there is. If this is all you live for, wow. Right now, for some of you, this seems pretty great. Your lives are pretty good. You're in good families, most of you, and you've got a good socioeconomic status, most of you, and most of you haven't been harmed or abused. Life can seem pretty good. Life rarely stays that way. And it doesn't stay that way out out in the world. It isn't like that. And what you'll find is your anticipation of all those things that you thought were going to bring you pleasure and bring you fulfillment, you'll find that they don't. There's only one thing, one anticipation that can't ever let you down, only one true hope that will always be fulfilled, and that's the return of your Savior to come get you and to make you look like Him and then to allow you to spend eternity with Him, serving, honoring, and pleasing Him for all of time. That's the only thing that never disappoints. And that's what they were waiting for. When your lives are changed, that's what you start to anticipate. Yes, when I I used to get my paycheck sent to me, now it just goes right into the bank, and that's fine. I get a little statement. I'm excited about that. But uh, I would would expect, I I know when the bills are arriving each month. month. I go out to the mailbox. I know for some of you, you don't even get bills in the mailbox. It's all electronic. Either way, go to my electronic mailbox. I'm like, I got to go get the bills. But I'll tell you, when I know the paycheck is in it, what do I do? I get to go get the paycheck. I'm very excited about the paycheck and I'm not so happy about the bills. You guys, you're, you know, you're excited about the end of school, not so much the beginning. You resignedly wait for school to start and you anxiously wait for it to end because that's hopeful to you. That's where your joy is found. You guys, we are anxiously awaiting the end of this life and we anxiously await it because at the end of it is our Savior. Whether he comes to get us before we die or whether we die and see him the millisecond afterwards, that is our hope. Everything else is temporal. The people you put your trust in, the stuff you put your trust in, the pleasure you put your trust in, that you're trying to find your, all your pleasure in you guys, th- this patient, hopeful expectation of rescue is the anticipation of seeing Jesus. To wait for his son from heaven, that is Jesus. And where's he coming from? He's coming from heaven. That is where God dwells. That's where God lives. He is is truly the living, holy God. 
God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Son, Jesus, using his human name, is coming back to get us. He's in heaven now. Again, as God, he's, he exists everywhere, but he's localized there. That's where his body is because he still retains that. And he is coming to get us again. And he's coming from the heavens. Remember what this, the angel said to the disciples in Acts 111? He said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? Because Jesus ascended up and they were like, man, where'd he go? Now we're stuck here. And he just come back and say, why do you stand around staring into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you watched him go into heaven. A bodily, actual return to earth to rule and reign, and you get to do that with him. It's a lot better than, you know, getting, getting a five on your AP test. That'd be cool. Right? But the return of Jesus is a lot better than that. Name your thing that you really enjoy. So the, antici the anticipation of seeing Jesus, guys, seeing your Savior. Think of the person you ha in your life have missed the most when you left. Some of you, you know, you went away from your parents and you just couldn't wait to get back. Some of you have a good friend that you went away from and you just couldn't wait to see them when they walked in the door. Increasingly, as I grow older and I'm married longer, every time I leave my wife, I just cannot wait to be back. It was in Argentina. I loved it. There, there, there flips a switch about, it's about five days into Argentina. I'm like, Argentina's nice. I'd like to see my wife. It, it, it's time to go home because I want to see her face and I want to be with her because she's, she's part of me. I anticipate that. I guess in, in a much deeper and greater way, I, and I, I pray you, ever increasing will anticipate the return of your Savior, the one whom you love, the one whom you've given your life for. You see, when you invest in someone, I've invested in my wife for about 26 years. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of joy. It's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. And so she's meaningful to me because I've poured my life into her. Well, Jesus is the same. You get out essentially what you put in. Are you constantly pouring your life into your service of the Lord Jesus? then you will anticipate his return. If you're not, you don't care. Everything else is going to be more important to you. Everything else you're going to anticipate more. But not the Thessalonians. They couldn't wait for Jesus to come. They anticipated they were going to gain eternal life. It says that, that, that is Jesus whom he raised from the dead. He can come back, of course, because he's not dead anymore. And if he's alive, then what's going to happen to you? You are also going to be alive for all of eternity. Not eternal death, but eternal life constantly living to serve and honor and please the Lord. Blessed be the God and Father, says 1 Peter 1, 3, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. But I need to leave you with one final thing that they were anticipating that's really important for you to remember. So they were anticipating seeing Jesus face to face. What a beautiful thought. They, they were anticipating receiving eternal life, but kind of on the flip side of that, they were waiting for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus who what? Who delivers us from the wrath to come. Oh, you see, there is something happening for everyone at the end. For those that know Christ, he's coming to save them. For those that don't know Christ, he's coming to do what? Pour out his wrath upon them. So, so which, which one would you prefer? What, which one would you like to anticipate? Either the wrath of God, that is God's settled, righteous, just anger against the sin that violates his character and nature to an infinite degree, would you rather receive that or would you rather receive the glorification, the burning away of sin and the intimacy of relationship for, with your Savior? Which one? I was driving behind this guy just yesterday and he had this bunch of bumper stickers on his car like he was really confused. He couldn't, you know, one was like coexist and the other one was like save the whales and it was all these different things and, and really kind of oddly right below all of that was this beware of dog. So it's on the back of a car. A, I mean, is a car, dog in the car? Does he run? I, you know, but it just struck me. I don't know why it's never struck me before really this way. That that's, that's the wrong bumper sticker. Christians wouldn't have a beware of dog bumper sticker and they, they really probably shouldn't have a beware of dog thing on their fence. You know what they ought to have? Beware of God. Beware of God. Because he's coming with wrath for those who don't know him. I've never seen that one, actually. Uh, maybe it is somewhere. Maybe some people don't do it because it feels a little, you know, sacrilegious to say, you know, not beware of dog, but beware of God. But it, it, it's a lot more fundamental. And that doesn't go over real well in our society today where God is loving everybody and the father of everybody and happy with everybody except a little unhappy 
No, his wrath is coming. Because anyone who rejects his son and rejects his truth, therefore falls underneath his wrath. So they anticipated deliverance from wrath. How about you? See, God has to be wrathful. God would completely dissolve and deny himself as God if he would not prove himself as a real and terrible, if he'd not prove himself with a real and terrible wrath against the sinning man. God cannot and will not favor sin. Therefore, his wrath burns against everyone who opposes him. The wrath of God is not an illusion. It is a reality. Yes, we are saved from the wrath to come. And if you're a believer, you are, but that's what I leave you with tonight. Can you say, could, well, do other people report about you that you've turned to God from idols? That, they can see that in your life? Or are you dominated? Are you dominated by pride and greed and jealousy and lust? Even if nobody else can really see that. It looks like a nice homeschool kid. Or a, or a pretty, in comparison, uh, a, a, a pretty upright public school kid. Or a kind of middle of the road Christian school kid. But inside you're eating up. You're always wondering, what are people thinking of me? What about me? What, what's going on for me? How's my life? That, that's all, you're consumed with it. Or are they saying, no, this person has totally changed. They're totally different. Their life is devoted to Christ. That you are constantly then anticipating the fact that Jesus will return. You're talking about it. You're living for it. And you have been rescued from the wrath to come. W would you tell your friends this? That they're slaves to dead idols and that they could turn and serve a living and true God? And would you show them? Would you tell your friends that everything that they anticipate and hope for, if it's not the Lord Jesus and his return, will ultimately fail them? And, and would you not ever be the hope that they have? Would you not ever try to be the one who will fulfill their expectations, but instead point them to Jesus? And will you tell them, please, to beware of God, to flee from the wrath to come, so that those ones that you know and love and cherish, your friends and neighbors and family members, would not suffer underneath the crushing hand of that wrath, but instead you and others would proclaim about them how they've turned away from those idols to serve a living and true God. Guys, I pray that the word of the Lord will sound forth from you. That in every place you go, people will be proclaiming, this is a person whose faith towards God is real because you have been truly transformed. Let's be like the Thessalonians. And let's not even be able to get a word out about everybody else in the youth group and their love for God because someone else is already saying it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together tonight. Might you be with each one as they go to small groups and bless their time as they talk and, and perhaps Consider personally the reality of the fact that you have set us free from dead idols to serve you and to love you and that this word would sound forth from us with increasing joy and power. In your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen.